Well, it's great to be back. It's been a long time since I've been able to be in Australia, and I'm delighted to be back here with you. Uh, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we praise you and bless you. You've called us to a church that is true. A church that teaches what you have left her. A gospel of salvation. And we ask, Lord, that you fill us with the wisdom that you have given us in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. By the same Holy Spirit who inspired them, inspire us to understand them so that we might direct everything in our minds and hearts and wills to give glory to you. And so we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, pray for us. Saint Simon Stock, pray for us. in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Tonight I've been asked to deal with two subjects, both of which are sources of a fair amount of controversy, and I'll do my best to do so with as much uh, honesty and respect as I can. The first is Scientology, the second is Freemasonry. Now, in terms of Scientology, let's deal with that probably a bit more quickly. I don't know, any of you here uh, belong to Scientology? There may be, there may be. Maybe you don't want to say it. But at any rate, it was founded by L. Ron Hubbard. Hubbard was the author of a number of B-quality science fiction books, and he did, you know, okay by them. But he had a famous quote saying that you can make more money starting your own religion than you can your own corporation, your own business. So he started a religion called Scientology. And there are a number of basic beliefs some people try to say that these are you know, similar to his science fiction worldview. I, I don't know that. I've never read any of his novels. But what I do know from former members of Scientology, as well as from the literature I've read uh, about Scientology, that the basic belief is this. There was another planet in which, which was inhabited the planet blew up, and the souls of all the people that lived there came hurtling through the outer space. When they came into our planet in order to take on bodies on Earth, these souls picked up something called engrams. And these are the vibrations or waves, as they might explain it, which caused them, it caused uh, people on Earth to be mentally unbalanced, if not outright crazy. Now, the goal of Scientology is to get you clear of the engrams. And clear is one of their standard phrases, one of their standard words, to explain the state of your being once you are free from the influence of engrams. Now, how do they know you have engrams? There is a little device that they have. Uh, there are a number of ways that they, they do this. They'll start off with psychological testing. I remember being uh, at a play. I was living in New York City at the time. 
and there was a, an off-Broadway play that I wanted to go see. Uh, as a college student, I could get tickets for $2. I liked the price. So, uh, <laughs> so I went to go see the play. And while we're waiting in line, uh, the, uh, they, tried to, they offered to do a psychological test. Fortunately, I was with another Jesuit who was, is himself a psychologist. And he started taking the test too. We thought, that, well, they, they posed as college kids and they're trying to do this survey and they wanted us to help them. Well, we were college students, so we said, sure, we'll help you out. Well, he looked, started answering this and he said, this test is totally bogus, let's get out of here. So we got back in line and got our tickets and saw the play, which was not all that good as it turned out. But one of the things that um, they'll ha do is get you into that test and say, well, we see that there's a certain problem here. And then they'll have you go and do the, an n-gram meter. Now, what it is, is a small machine, and there'll be what looks like two tin cans, and you put your hands on the ends of two electrodes. You don't get shocked or anything. Uh, it's not painful, but you put on there and see, and sure enough, the n-gram meter will go up. Now, as I've been told, this n-gram meter is the same thing as a lie detector machine. How does a lie detector machine work? When you tell a falsehood, your body, you, you're, you can't help it, your hands will sweat. And so that will make the electricity, you know, there'll be, you'll become a conductor and a, and, a, and a ground, and the meter will go up showing that you're not telling the truth. At that point, you say a falsehood, okay? Now, if your hands are inside two tin cans, what are they going to do? Sweat. So inevitably, <clears throat> inevitably, the n-gram meter will go up. Now, there's a course that you can take to get rid of those n-grams, which they offer. It's a basic course. And it costs a few hundred dollars. And then there are other courses. And the courses get more and more expensive so that eventually you can end up paying $250,000 to go through all the courses. However, at the earlier stages, you graduate and you become a teacher of the lower courses. And the money that you get for teaching those lower courses goes for you to pay for your next level course. So it would be something of a, a pyramid approach that you can keep going up the scale and be able to take these courses and eventually get yourself clear. Now, another characteristic of the Scientologists is that they develop their own language. For instance, the word clear. Um, if there was a movie, I can't remember the name of it, I never saw it, but it was uh, starring a very famous Scientologist actor, John Travolta. And in it, he had been uh, someone who was mentally deficient they did some sort of a procedure on him, and he became absolutely brilliant. And in that movie, he would keep on saying, oh, now I see, it's all clear to me. And he kept using that word clear. Uh, and he was communicating some of his own Scientology lingo. But there are there's a lot of other lingo they do. Now, in most groups, in most groups, there are, uh, ways to have, you know, inside language. I mean, everybody does that. As a matter of fact, your whole continent has a lot of inside language. I don't understand. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm st still trying to learn some of it. Uh, some of it I do better at than others, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I can't remember all of them now, but at any rate, the, you, everybody has slang, and of course we have slang and in, in words in the United States, and those things change over time, that's for sure. But one of the reasons you can also develop a whole language 
is so that you can keep a certain amount of control over a group. And that is the fear that some critics have of Scientology, that they developed this kind of language in order to have, them, have their members speaking among themselves as a group who is in the know. This is very attractive. I know what these words mean. And if somebody else, like myself, uses a word like clear, they'll have this sort of knowing smile, like mm -hmm. he thinks he knows what clear means, but he doesn't really know what clear means. <laughs> and that, that'll be true with any other use of the language, that you'll be considered uh, to be something like a little monkey who imitates them, but doesn't really understand it because you haven't gone through the process of getting yourself clear. Okay, so that would be one of the uh, senses that they have. Now, this is something uh, of part of the problem because it keeps a lot of people out. The more you get into it, you, the more you can learn about what the meanings of the words are and you get into this other world view. And it, it is truly a world view and uh, they consider themselves to be a religion. Now, during his life, L. Ron Hubbard ran into a lot of difficulties because he called this a religion. However, our uh, in Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, which collects our income taxes, did not quite understand what he meant by religion. And they thought that their definition of religion and his were different. So he ended up having to live on a yacht in international waters for the rest of his life. He uh, couldn't come back to land because he was uh, severely wanted uh, for income tax evasion. So that, and he was never convicted. He was just wanted for income tax evasion. Now, this is uh, uh, part of the core of it. People like John Travolta and um, uh, who's the other guy? Tom Cruise. Both of them were raised Catholic. And Tom Cruise has apparently no interest. In fact, he was in the seminary for a short while. But they have apparently no interest. He has no interest in Catholicism. But somebody like John Travolta has oftentimes said, there's nothing inconsistent about being a Scientologist and a Catholic. Uh, I'm a Catholic and I'm a uh, Scientologist and it's all okay. Well, it's not. It's not. Uh, you cannot be a good Catholic and a Scientologist because, for one thing, a core difference is that we believe, as Catholics, that the soul of each individual is created at the moment of conception and is unique to that person. Reincarnation in any form, including from other planets, is unacceptable as a Catholic. That each human being is unique, and has, was created by God directly. As a matter of fact, that's one of the great honors that women have. You know, physical matter is no longer being created. You can have, according to the laws of Newton, matter may change form, but there's no new matter created. You can change something into carbon by burning it, but it doesn't disappear, it just changes into carbon. And then it can change from carbon back to something else. If it lands in some place where it can grow into a plant, it becomes another form of carbon. And a wide variety of things can happen, but there's just alteration of the matter, there's no creation of new matter. But women, women are privileged because the last aspect of creation goes on in the womb of women. Not during the act of procreation, but sometime later, when a sperm and an, and an ovum unite, it's the woman alone with God. And at that moment, God does something he does nowhere else in the physical universe. He creates a soul. And this is why uh, Alice von Hildebrand speaks of women's wombs as being like a holy of holies because it's something where God is acting very powerfully. Well, if Scientology were correct, that would not be the case, that there would not be this creation of new souls. It's 
uh, using old souls. And that in itself is problematic for a Catholic. Secondly, we don't believe in engrams. I mean, there's nothing that we, that the church has for or against engrams. I mean, if scientists found these things, that would be up to scientists. But what we do believe is that you cannot be redeemed from sin by hanging on to engrams or by losing them. That has nothing to do with the salvation of your soul. This is where the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is determinative. And that reconciliation with God has everything to do with the reconciliation that Jesus Christ works. So this is something that's very, uh, very crucial for us to keep very much in mind, that this is one of the things that we have to uh, pay close attention to. So I don't know that there's much more that I want to say about Scientology, I accept um, as a Catholics, you may not be a Catholic in good standing and join. I wouldn't experiment with it. I don't think that it's a safe experimentation. Um, Scientology is very wealthy. Scientology has, uh, in fact, bought a, a very large uh, amount of uh, real estate in Tampa, Florida, Tampa, St. Pete. And they, they own a lot of buildings there and they are very, very successful. But there are a lot of stories. You can read books by people who were Scientologists and got out of it. And you can get some idea of who L. Ron Hubbard was and various literature. But hopefully that would not be too much of a concern for you. Um, and I hope that nobody feels a temptation to either join or to stay within it uh, in order to be a good Catholic. Now, the second topic is something that is probably more to the point uh, for a lot of people, because this is something that is uh, quite vibrant and is of a different nature than Scientology, and that is the Masonic Lodge or Freemasonry. Freemasonry claims its roots in those masons, stone masons, who formed guilds as builders of the great cathedrals of Europe and other monuments. You know, when you build a cathedral, the old cathedrals were not built by big corporations. The old cathedrals were built by the folks in the parishes. That's why they sometimes took hundreds of years. People would go to the quarries and cut stone to be brought and then bring them themselves. Then they would also form the stone and, and cut it on the site. But the people who were working on these cathedrals were butchers and bakers and candlestick makers. They were the people who did all the other jobs in the city. And so stonemasons would be part of, of a mobile guild. A guild was a group of, a, of professionals who had various norms for membership. You would start off usually as an apprentice, then a journeyman, and then you'd be a member of the guild and a full member. And that wasn't just for the Guild of Masons. This was the Guild for cloth makers, tailors, and many other uh, skilled works that they would have these guilds. And the guilds would, uh, especially the Guild of Masons, was known because it had a lot of secret signs. You might have somebody who says, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a Mason. And this was risky because the Masons had to travel around to the different building sites. They didn't have a job in the one town like the other guilds did. The cloth maker guild knew everybody in the city. So if you were an apprentice, everybody knew it. If you were a journeyman, everybody knew it because you lived and worked with those people. But Masons had to travel from one place to another. And so they would develop 
secret symbols and secret handshakes in order to let other master masons know who was an apprentice, who was a journeyman, who was a full-fledged member as a master mason. And that was part of their, uh, the quality of their itinerant work. Now, this is something that the popes have brought out as a great irony, is that the guild that built the great cathedrals of Europe, which are still some of the most wonderful buildings you can go to see, how many of you have been to Europe? How many of you made sure that all of your trips to Europe uh, include sightseeing of factories? <laughs> How about bank buildings? <laughs> cathedrals? <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, these, these cathedrals of Europe are still wonders. It's like lace made out of stone in so many of these, especially in the French cathedrals. But the, the English and Germans are also just phenomenal, phenomenal. And it's ironic that those masons who built those beautiful cathedrals and works of faith have been usurped by an organization that is anti-Catholic. Now, the theoretical masons those are the Masons who are not the practical Masons, but the ones who are, you know, when the organization we now know is Freemasonry. They formed in 1717 in England. It was a number of Protestant pastors and laymen who started these groups using some of the handshakes and symbols of the practical Masons in order to form a secret society. And they developed within it, just like in the old guild, the first levels were three stages of apprentice, journeyman, and master. And when what's known as the Blue Lodge, which is the most basic lodge, you have those three degrees. And every mason has to go through those three degrees in order to become a master mason. Now, beyond that, there are many other degrees, depending on what kind of lodge you belong to. The two most popular, well, first of all, masonry is most popular in the English-speaking world where it began, in England, and her colonies and former colonies. That would include Australia, of course, the United States. It was very popular there. The first lodge in the United States also started in the 1700s. I don't know when masonry got started here in Australia, but it was probably fairly early on. And the different English forms of the Masonic Lodge have two main groups. One is known as the York Rite, the other is known as the Scottish Rite. It's in the Scottish Rite that you have the 33 degrees of the Masonic Lodge. In the Scottish, in the uh, York Rite, they have different kinds of degrees. And one of the things that happened after the 33 degrees, the 33rd degree was developed, uh, that these were all you know, fascinating and interesting, but after a while they got kind of boring. One of the ways that you know, the Masonic Lodge developed is that at, since there really wasn't that much spiritually going on at the lower degrees, they kept making more degrees. And some of the lodges had even more than 33 degrees. And then there are groups beyond it, like the Shriners, the Shriners were started by a circus clown. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. He was a circus clown and comedian. He was the most popular comedian in the United States uh, back in the 1880s when he started the Shriners. And this was meant to be a benevolent society, uh, but they would do a lot of things to have fun. It was kind of slapstick. 
a little bit, uh, you had to be a mason to get into the Shriners, but it had a sort of slapstick quality to it. They would play all kinds of tricks and make you do absurd things, dressed in women's clothes and, you know, just uh, be made a fool of, and then you could join the, the Shriners. And they're, they're famous in the United States, I don't know about here, but in the United States they're famous for their hospitals for children. So that's one of the things they do. And they have, you know, now they have these little cars and little motorcycles. They're absurdly small and these rather unfortunately large men <laughs> who really could do with a diet usually uh, are riding around these little cars and funny hats and clothes and, and they're having fun and they use that as a way to promote the Shriners and to promote donations to their hospital okay, and hospitals. So that's another degree that, that gets developed. Now, one of the things that we then have to keep in mind, what is it that they teach? There are three main points that is consistent in the Masonic Lodge belief. The first most basic belief is what we usually call fog, fog bomb. Fog bomb. Fog bomb stands for the fatherhood of God Brotherhood of Man. Okay, so fog bomb. And that's a good way to remember it. All right? Now, the third belief, so that's the first belief is that God is the father of everybody. The second belief is that all men are brothers. And the third belief is that of the immortality of the soul. According to most Masonic lodges, nobody can be a Mason unless... He believes in God. And they also must believe in the brotherhood of all men. But they also will accept people from any and all religions. You need to, you can have any religion that you want to believe in, and you can follow any religion. So that there are Christians, Jews, Muslims, uh, Farsi, uh, the, the uh, Zoroastrians, what they mean by that. Uh, Hindus, Buddhists, doesn't matter. But they don't want, in general, they don't want atheists. Now, some lodges do accept atheists. <laughs> some lodges do accept atheists. But for the most part, they don't want atheists because that goes against the most basic doctrine of the fatherhood of God. And then they also believe in the immortality of the soul. And that the soul does have life after death. And that every Mason is going to be following this Masonic work in order to uh, get to the immortality of the soul and live, it, live out to the best of their possibilities. So that's, that's what you have going on there. Now, what is the Catholic Church's stance to all this? Well, we believe in the fatherhood of God. We don't have a problem with that. We don't have a real problem of looking upon all human beings as having a certain type of brotherhood. And we also believe in the immortality of the soul. So does the Catholic Church have any problems with the Masonic Lodge? Absolutely yes. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church has repeatedly made it clear from 1738, just 21 years after the first lodge was founded in England, Pope Clement XII and his successors, Benedict XIV, Pius VII, Leo XII, Gregory VII, and Leo XIII have all made it very clear that no Catholic may join the Masonic Lodge under pain of excommunication, and no Catholic can receive the sacraments if they have joined the Masonic Lodge, and if a non-Catholic marries a Catholic woman, that he must declare that he's a Mason before that marriage can be done, and that no Mason, because it's considered a foreign religion, it's not a Christian religion, this is a very serious sin. 
And there was a certain rumor that belonging to the Masonic Lodge was now permitted by the Catholic Church. That was absolutely false. The Vatican made it undeniably clear that no Catholic may receive the sacraments if he has joined the Masonic Lodge. And any Catholic who has done so has to either publicly, if he's publicly known to be a Mason, he must publicly reject his Masonic membership in order to come back to the sacraments. If he's only privately and secretly known to be a Mason, then he can secretly and privately renounce it, but never go back to it and never be part of it again. Now this is the situation for the Masonic Lodge. The question is, if the Catholic Church believes in the fatherhood of God and in the brotherhood of man, why is there a problem? Why should we have it? Well, first of all, the most basic problem is that when the, when the Masonic Lodge talks about uh, fog bomb, fatherhood of God, God, brotherhood of man, they do it on the basis of a naturalistic religion. The Masonic Lodge buys into the ideas of the 18th century Enlightenment. In the 18th century, the Enlightenment wanted to make human reason the norm of all reality and all truth. And nature is the book of revelation. In the 18th century, it was typical that people would believe in God. There were some atheists, but not too many. But they believed in the God of nature, and they believed in a, a law of nature that you can discover just by the use of your reason. And you can discover everything you need to know about God by reason. That was what we, they mean by a naturalistic religion, a religion of nature. So this is going to be one of the problems. Because then, if your religion is based on what you can find by reason and by nature, then you do not need revelation. And at that point, the Masonic Lodge necessarily teaches that the Christian doctrine of the Blessed Trinity, that God is your Father, but God is also the Son and the Holy Spirit, these become negotiable. As far as the Masonic Lodge is concerned, you do not have to believe in the Trinity to be a Mason. If you're a Muslim, that's fine with them. If you are a Buddhist who is a, basically agnostic, because the core of Buddhism is agnosticism. They don't say there is a God, they don't say that there isn't. Buddha didn't know. That wasn't his concern. So you can be a Buddhist or you can be a Hindu who is a pantheist, believing in many, many gods. Any one of those is equally acceptable so long as you take the naturalistic approach to the fatherhood of God that is key to the Masonic Lodge in order to be a member of it. And this is something that no Catholic can afford to do. You cannot treat the Blessed Trinity as negotiable. It is not. Our salvation depends on God being a God of love. Without the Trinity, you don't have a God of love. Because who would be doing the loving? Who would be loved? Who would be the love itself? The Trinity is necessary for God to be love because there has to be someone who from all eternity is loved and is loving. And that that wonder of the Blessed Trinity reveals that. Plus, the incarnation of Christ would be negotiable to a Mason. They don't need to believe that Christ became man. And they don't need to believe that it's God who took on flesh. That Jesus Christ is not just a moral teacher. And this is one of the problems that the Masonic Lodge falls into. It tries to teach 
treat Jesus as a great teacher, which he is. We don't deny that he's a great teacher. But his teaching authority does not come because he simply was able to read what it says in nature. It's rather that he is God made flesh and his authority is the authority of God himself. And that we accept his teaching and the authority of his gospel because of the incarnation of God in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The atonement is very negotiable to the Masonic Lodge. Because in the Masonic Lodge, you save yourself by doing good deeds. And by doing those good deeds, you are able to get to this immortality of the soul and be in the celestial dwelling place made by the great architect. Because what they do is they, if they're Masons, well, they may call God their father of all mankind, they also treat God as the great architect because they use this imagery from the Masonic building skills. Whereas we believe that God is not only loving from all eternity, but God loves us so much that he took on flesh and he re redeemed us from sin. Christ is God made flesh who died on the cross for us. And that we don't have reconciliation with God just because we do good deeds. This is something that is not part of our Catholic faith. That that would be the basis of our getting to heaven. It's rather, we are sinners who needed to have atonement made by the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, an infinite sacrifice offered for our sins. Because our sins are not just little peccadillos that we just say, oh, well, it's just no big deal to God. It's rather that because of God's majesty being offended, our sins have an infinite quality and only infinite God dying on the cross for the sake of our reconciliation with God is able to make up for our sins. This is not a negotiable for any Catholic. And not only is that not negotiable, neither is baptism. St. Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 3, baptism now saves you. It is not something that is, can be slid by. It's not negotiable. It's not something we neglect. If the scripture says that baptism saves you, we need to be saved. And we accept that gift of baptism in order to be saved. And that's a non-negotiable, though for the Masonic Lodge, it obviously is negotiable because non-baptized members share fully in all the spiritual claims that the Masonic Lodge makes. And the role of the church is not only negotiable, they look upon the church as an enemy. There's an inimical relationship with the Catholic Church that goes back. Now, I would say this. The Masonic Lodge of the Orient, the French Masonic Lodge of the Orient, is far more anti-clerical and hates the church more vehemently. But you go through Albert Pike and the other basic writers and commentators on the Masonic Lodge, and you will see that their rejection of the Catholic Church is just as strong. And it's not only a few writers here and there. In my own country, the United States, members of the Masonic Lodge have gotten into our Supreme Court, especially since a Mason, namely uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, stacked the court with more Masons, and they did everything they could to isolate the government and public life from the church. It was a Masonic judge, Hugo Black, who before he was a Supreme Court Justice in the United States, wrote a law to make Catholic schools illegal in the state of Oregon. And his goal was to make Catholic schools illegal in that state and then in all the states. 
Well, but they took it to the Supreme Court before he was on the court, and then and they won. Later, when he was on the Supreme Court, he wrote decisions that tried to alienate the Catholic schools from any kind of aid, and he came up with a phrase that is not in our Constitution at all, but it is in the teaching of the Masonic Lodge and one of its other presidential members, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had written that there's a wall of separation between the church and the state. Now, when he wrote that, he actually wrote it to say that the church needs to be and can be protected from interference by the state. But Justice Hugo Black, who not only was a Mason, but especially as was uh, true of the Masonic Lodge of that period, which was very racist, he was also a member of the Ku Klux Klan, the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan of the state of Alabama back in the 1930s, right before he was put onto the Supreme Court by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And this gentleman you know, did a lot of work in order to get Catholicism in particular, but other uh, religions as well, separated from the church, from, excuse me, from the government. And throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, decisions were made by these Masonic judges to increase the separation between the church and the state and to make the role of the church very much reduced in public life. Now, that was just a small thing. We're still strong in the, in the United States, but it cannot compare to the wickedness perpetrated by the Masonic Lodge against the Catholic Church with an open, violent, bloody, and murderous persecution of the Catholic Church in Mexico. In Mexico, the Masonic Lodge dominated the government since the 1860s, probably even 1850s, not long after their liberation from Spain. And by the early 1900s, they began a persecution of the Catholic Church. They even went so far as to make wine illegal in Mexico to make sure the mass could not be celebrated. And anybody caught with a bottle of wine could be arrested and put in prison because they suspected it would be used for uh, mass. And they were usually right. But a number of, of Catholics, uh, Laymen, religious, and clergy, by the thousands, were martyred at the hands of the Masonic government because they looked upon the Catholic Church as an enemy. Now, that's our first objection to the Masonic Lodge. <laughs> Our second objection is that a Mason also has to take a series of oaths. They take a number of oaths, first of all, of secrecy. Now, I've read frequently the various ceremonies of the Masonic Lodge. Why is that? Because they're not that good at keeping it a secret. <laughs> And you can read this in all kinds of, 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 of places. Lots of Masons have made these known. But these oaths would not be considered valid for any Catholic to take. Because some of the oaths are blood oaths. They take an oath that if they break the secrecy of the lodge, they make a sign from ear to ear across their neck, across their stomach, and then down their stomach to show that if they break these oaths, they can be cut from ear to ear, their neck will be cut, and they can be cut open and disemboweled. Now, no Catholic can take such an oath. That is a sinful oath to take, to keep some silly secret. And I would call the secret silly after, have, after I've read them that you don't swear to kill yourself or 
conversely, potentially even take part in killing somebody else for breaking the oath. Now, in fact, there are not many killings of Masons for breaking the oaths. I don't know of too many. There's some cases here or there. A couple times they're even doubtful. But whether it's done or not, it is still illegitimate for a Catholic to take such an oath and also to protect these passwords and such and, and secret grips and handshakes. That, that is a vain and rash swearing of an oath and no Catholic may do this. Now, along with that too, uh, there is another quality that I, I would object to uh, in the Masonic oaths. And that is that these promises that they make to keep these various secrets include oaths to protect a brother Mason at any cost. No matter what the Mason has done, except murder and treason. So that if you know that a Mason has done some crime, then, and you're a brother Mason, you may not testify against him. If a brother Mason is on a trial and you're part of the jury, you may not vote to convict him, even if you know that he's guilty. Now that's not legitimate. That's not a love of truth. That's a protection of your own at any cost, but that is not acceptable for a Catholic. If you know somebody to be a criminal and you are called upon to testify, you have an obligation when you swear a legitimate oath to tell the truth in a trial, you have an obligation to tell the truth. If you perjure yourself, you've done two sins. One, you've taken a vain oath to protect the Mason. And two, you've taken a legitimate oath in a courtroom and you lie under oath. That is breaking the Eighth Commandment in two different ways. And that is unacceptable for any Christian, yet alone a Catholic. So this is something that nobody may take part in. And that these, uh, this is one of the things that is very much uh, a concern that we have with the Masonic Lodge. And then the third issue that I would bring up is the, especially in Europe, the Masonic order has done a lot to try to destroy the Catholic Church so that there would be a purely secular society and that they want to have easy divorce laws, the abolition of parochial schools, as I already mentioned. They especially tried to promote cremation and suppression of religious orders, especially my own order, the Society of Jesus. And they also have, as I mentioned before, a separation of the church and the state that was not part of our Constitution in the United States. I don't know about your Constitution. The only two constitutions I know of that had separation of church and state was the French Constitution and the Soviet Union's Constitution. I don't want to model a Constitution on either one. Now, these are some of the problems that we have as Catholics. And we have to remember that the church does not prohibit membership in groups. There's nothing wrong with belonging to a group, a society that's benevolent. We have lots of them inside the church. St. Vincent de Paul Society. How many of you work for the St. Vincent de Paul Society? A few of you here. Do you have any secret oaths? <laughs> no. The only thing that you, you do is you help the poor. What a wonderful thing. And there's not enough hands went up for that. That's a good thing to join. Um, and in the United States, we have the Knights of Columbus. 
I'm a knight of Columbus, and we don't have any secret oaths. The only thing that we do is we promise that we won't tell non-members what goes on in the initiation so that they can experience it for themselves. Not because it's a secret, we want them to experience it firsthand without having you know, the preparation. So I didn't know until I became a knight, but having gone through the knights, I was very alert to this. Is this some sort of a secret oath? Not at all, and we don't take an oath, by the way. We just promise that we won't you know, reveal what, what happens you know, in the initiation levels, but there are no secret doctrines. As a matter of fact, the only doctrines of the Knights of Columbus are the doctrines of the Catholic Church. And you have down here the Knights of the Southern Cross, I believe. Yes. And the Knights, how many of you are Knights of the Southern Cross? Any, any members here of the Knights of the Southern Cross? And again, do you have any secret oaths? No. Absolutely not. <laughs> See? He's adamant. And I suspect not enough knights, not enough hands went up for that either. Uh, do, you, do you welcome any new members? Of course. Okay. <laughs> and it's, it's a great thing because this is one of the organizations in the United States, the Knights of Columbus, and I'm sure it's time here, that the men in the parishes work together to help build up the church, to evangelize, to help the poor and a wide variety of other things. It's a good thing to be part of these groups. But we don't have any secret doctrines. We don't have any blood oaths. You know, they, they give Knights of Columbus swords, uh, not us priests. I don't know if they think that we're extra clumsy or what. <laughs> but when I had gotten my uh, fourth degree as a Knight of Columbus, I had just come in, in the, from hunting uh, uh, wild game. And uh, maybe they thought that I'd been dangerous enough already, so they didn't want to give me another weapon. But be that as it may, it, you know, the, uh, the, the Knights of Columbus don't have any secret oaths, and you can join these groups. But no Catholic in good standing may join the Masonic Lodge. That is forbidden. That is something that is a serious sin, and means that a person who does so may not may not receive the sacraments. So that's something that we have to keep very clear. Can both men and women be members of the Masons? No, the Masonic Lodge is limited to men, but there are women's auxiliary groups. And the, um, I forget the cutoff age, I think it's 18, or, or uh, I'm not positive, but there is a, a youth group as well so that you can uh, belong to a, a, a group before you're Mason, and then you can join full Masonic Lodge as an adult. It is oriented towards adults. Okay, so the question is, uh, this gentleman has a couple of brothers who are Masons. They say that they do a lot of good work, uh, hospitals and other things. Can we go against the good work? There's no need to go against their, their good work. If it's good, then it's just no need to go against it. However, that, that that's not enough of a reason to belong to the Masonic Lodge. And I don't believe that that's their main reason. If they wanted to do good work, they would join the St. Vincent de Paul Society. <laughs> and they... And the other, point, the other point I would make is that, uh, I don't, again, I don't know the Masonic Lodge here in Australia, but in the United States, there was a huge scandal because over 90% of the money collected did not get to the hospitals. That it was used by the Masonic Lodge for entertainment to raise the money, and less than 10% actually got to the hospitals. Now, I, I have no idea what it's like here. I have none at all. But I do know that if you give money to some work that nuns are running, the money gets to where it's going. Or they'll grab you by the earlobes and take you to the sacristy to wear you out. You know, so, so you've got a, a much better chance of the money getting to the, the, the good work if it's being done in, under Catholic auspices. And even secular organizations admit that. Uh, groups like uh, Bread for the World, which is not a religious group, 
not a Catholic group, but they themselves will say that you have a much better chance of getting money with religious groups, Christian religious groups, to make sure the money gets to the people who need it rather than other groups, and, and need I say, more so than governments. <laughs> let, me, let me deal with the second question, that's, that's easier. The, the, the question, or, or the wondering whether Judaism had anything to do with the origin of, of Mormonism. Of uh, Mormonism. <laughs> I can come back to the Mormons because they're very influenced by the Masons. Their liturgy comes from the Masonic Lodge. But in terms of the Jews and the Masonic Lodge, that's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. It was started by Christian ministers and laymen. And that's where it has its root. Now, Jews were early welcome on, but they didn't found it. They had nothing to do with it. And the, Mason, the Masons who built the cathedrals were hardly Jewish. Now, they had to be Catholics to be in the guilds. So that, that, that's just nonsense. In terms of the Illuminati, the problem with dealing with the Illuminati is that they become a catch-all for any foolishness that goes on. And so I, I have heard mention of the Illuminati being associated with uh, Illuminati was started by uh, an ex-priest named Weishaupt. Um, but they were such a short-lived group, and they gained a certain amount of mythic quality. And I, I don't know that it'd be possible for them to do all the damage that they actually did. They're credited with starting communism and Masonic Lodge and lots of other things that are incompatible with each other. So I, I don't, unless I get concrete evidence, and I want to see the direct evidence, I don't pursue it. Uh, whenever I'm dealing with something, show me the data. I don't, and, and this, this is something that actually is uh, important because in dealing with a lot of different groups. For instance, when I was here speaking against the New Age movement, a lot of questions came up. Well, is the New Age movement part of the Masonic Lodge? No. Do they have a lot of ideas in common? Absolutely. But they don't have the same ideas in common because they're the same organization. It's rather that they're part of the Enlightenment-influenced culture that we live in. And so you don't necessarily have to see that just because some ideas are the same, that therefore they're the same group. They're part of the post-enlightenment society that we all live in, and they pick up a lot of the same ideas. So, and that's what I suspect is going on with the Illuminati too, okay? What reasons are given that they want to persecute and, and remove the influence of the Catholic Church? It's because they don't agree with us. <laughs> you know, that their form of religion is contrary to that of, the, of Catholicism. So they don't want you know, what the, the Catholic Church believes in to be dominant in society. They want a naturalistic religion. And so the, the, the Catholic Church is the biggest kid on the block. You know, in the United States of America right now, uh, and another issue, this is not a Masonic issue, but it's a, another issue, namely abortion and homosexual marriage, the sexual issues. The secular people are so strongly against Catholicism because we're the biggest religion on the block. And we are the only ones who can really stand up to them. The Protestant mainline churches in my country are dying. And the, the evangelical churches are splintering. We now have 42,000 different denominations because they keep splitting off from each other. And so they, don't, they lose the power of having a voice to speak out in unison. Catholics still have that if they'll use it. So the question is, how did the, the, if they started in 1717, how did the Freemasons become so influential of presidents, senators, and uh, Supreme Court justices, the whole government of Mexico, the leadership of the government of Italy, Garibaldi and, and his associates were all Freemasons. So how did they do that? Well, for one thing, they appeal to being elitist. 
And there was a song way back in the 60s when I was a kid called I'm In With The In Crowd. Well, that's part of the appeal, is that you're part of the in crowd. And it builds up on itself when you get wealthy uh, Englishmen who started it, and then wealthy Americans who also want to be part of an elite. I know we are. Well, no, 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 but, that, but you cannot underestimate the desire to be part of the inner circle. Now, you also keep in mind what I said before, that they have a naturalistic religion, and that that also was popular in the 18th century. And an appeal to naturalistic religion, where the enlightenment mentality that reason is the be all and end all, this is a group that's promising that you can have that kind of, you know, you're part of the intelligentsia. I was approached by one of my aunt's ex-husbands, while well, they were still married. My aunt had a number of ex-husbands. <laughs> and a number, number of them, as, as we say in Alabama, uh, some of them, their cornbread wasn't cooked. This was one of the least cooked of the cornbread. <laughs> but he invited me to be a mason. He said, look, and this is what he said to me, you sound to, to me like a significant person. If you join the Masonic Lodge, we'll make sure that you end up becoming a bishop or an archbishop. <laughs> I said, no thanks. I took an oath, I, I took a vow, not an oath, but I took a vow against being a bishop. <laughs> Only my boss can make me, that is the Pope. So, you know, that kind of appeal, though, is said, you know, that you are a special person and you are significant. Therefore, you join us and we'll help you to fulfill that desire to be significant. So that's how they made their appeal. When you see something on the internet, I would be automatically suspicious that, you know, because that's easy to, to, to do. Remember, I work in television. I know how an editing machine works. You don't have to have the Pope's hand there. And my question is, who took this photo, this movie? Footage with Tony Blair. It's footage with Tony Blair. And who took the footage of them doing that? Now, I want to see exactly that. And what's that? YouTube. It's on YouTube. There you go. There's a source. Now, <laughs> have you noticed the Vatican saying anything about it? No, wait, 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 answer my question. Has the Vatican said anything denying it? No, because it's not an, even an issue. And I guarantee you that this is not what was going on. I know, I'm just telling you, I guarantee you that he's not a Mason. What is the, the, the connection between the Mason, the Masonic Lodge, and the New World Order? First of all, they do promote a new world order of a secularized society of naturalistic religion where everybody is a brother and God is the father and you have a mortal uh, belief in immortality of the soul. They, they want that. And they want a society that will run on naturalistic, rational bases and they want it to be a happier society and a better society. That's, that's their goal. Now, what that specifically means is not always clear because you can use New World Order in so many different ways. And, I, and, and you can make that a catchphrase and then into a boogeyman catchphrase. You gotta be careful of that because this is not something that should just be there to scare you. Show me what you mean. And in my country, for instance, we have a new world order in which the government is taking over our medical, uh, so, uh, our medical care. 
I am flat against it. They can barely get the mail delivered. <laughs> and and we're, they're, they're going to be, they're already causing problems for our medical uh, services. And they just started. The first implementation just started. That kind of new order is just incompetency. And that's why I'm against it. They, were, they thought it, that it would be more uh, efficient. I don't think, I, in fact, already the evidence has shown that it's not going to be. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that you have to be very specific about what they mean and which Mason you're talking about. See, that's, you know, do you think that they all agree? They don't. I mentioned the three basic beliefs, fatherhood of God, brotherhood of man, immortality of the soul. They would generally agree on that, but they don't agree on how many different uh, degrees there are, what those degrees might be. They don't agree on a lot of other doctrines, and they would not agree on the New World Order either. So that's why you have to ask anybody who brings that up, what do you mean by that? And then we'll talk as to whether I agree with you or disagree with you. Now, the excessive nationalism is something anybody who's a Christian should reject. That the nation is also subject to the judgment of God. And that the rules and the laws of the nation are subject to God's laws. Not that I want the church to run the government, nor do I want the government to run the church. I think we have to have a, par a, a, a kind of parallel role influencing each other, to be sure. And uh, in no way do I want to see the state running, uh, being run by the church. That's, that's a disaster, too. But neither should the, the government isolate itself from the church. And that isolation of the government from the influence of the church, that would be very explicitly Masonic doctrine, in, at least in my country. That's very explicitly Masonic. And that's a, a, a very wrong-headed way to approach uh, life and government. So we need to you know, make sure that we are in favor, not of separation of church and state, but balance and integration of church and state. That would be my own kind of model. So that the critique of immoral laws, for instance, in my country, the law of slavery, Racist laws. They were critiqued by the church. A lot of people don't know this, but the popes, beginning with Eugene IV, condemned the slave trade from the first year it began. And every century, the popes recondemned the slave trade. Nobody listened to them. That was a big mistake, especially for the poor slaves, but also for the rest of the, the folks as well, everybody suffers from that kind of oppression, even if they're the oppressors. So the church should be able to have influence. In World War I, the church was the strongest voice telling all of the different empires to cease and desist the march toward war. Pius X tried to stop it. Benedict XV tried to stop it. And then at the end of the war, it was Benedict XV, the lone voice in Europe saying, we need to avoid punishing the Axis powers. Don't punish Germany and Austria and Hungary and Turkey. Rather, reintegrate them into the family of nations. Nobody listened. The Pope was right. And all that they did was start the seeds of a new war. This kind of integration of the faith and the morals is what we have to do without allowing the church to run the state. And that, that would be the approach I would take. All right, let me give you a blessing. Lord, we praise you and bless you. We ask that you fill us with your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in all things. May Almighty God bless you cause his face to shine upon you, direct all of your ways toward him, and lead you by the paths of his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.